from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now here's your host, Dave Vellante. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Cube conversation. My name is Dave Vellante, and I'm here with Dave Faithful, who's the chief architect of WEI. Dave, thanks for coming on the Cube. Thanks for having me. So. First, tell me about WEI, and then I want to understand your role there. Sure. Uh, at WEI, I'm our chief architect and responsible for uh, driving uh, technology solutions uh, that we uh, work with our, our customer base on. So, uh, WEI is a value-added reseller, uh, supporting Fortune 1000 enterprise customers. Um, it takes us all over the world and supporting their environments. Uh, and we're typically designing and architecting uh, uh, IT service delivery models for those customers and, and aligning those those architectures with their business needs. So, um, are you typically like to describe like the sweet spot of your customer base? You mentioned you know basically large companies, mm -hmm. and you're interacting. You know, who's your point of contact? Is it the is it the architect to architect? You know, who you're talking to? On it's, the uh, it's all levels of the IT organization, typically from the CIO on down. So understanding what the business goals of our customers uh, are, and then working with those IT directors, IT managers, uh, and and uh, IT architecture leads to develop um, solutions that fit those business models. So. Uh, you know, to these days, um, you know, software-defined data center computing is is uh, is big. Creating service delivery models that are cloud-like in nature, whether on-prem or in a hybrid environment or a public service, are things that our customers are trying to do. Migrating from that traditional IT architecture to uh, this new software-defined world. So we're going to talk about storage later on, but but I wonder, thinking about the top level, the the C-level executive in IT. Is he or, she, or he or she, are they concerned about storage? What's on their mind? What's top of mind for those guys? Typically it's really just how do they leverage IT to deliver uh, value back to the business, right? How do they make their companies uh, more competitive in the marketplace? How do they get their products out to market faster, uh, faster than before and faster than their competition? So they're trying to leverage IT as a service, as a utility, and they're trying to create that, that, that utility model, that service delivery model, to support their business needs, which, uh, you know, they, IT has to be more responsive than ever before. They don't have months to get something out. They have sometimes days or hours. And so they've got to build those models, while at the same time, right, they've got to support their existing traditional environment. So they've got this juggling act. At the sea level, that's typically what we see they're worried about. How they get there is up to their IT organizations, right? Then, and that's where we're helping them to architect those solutions. Yeah, so the CIOs that we talked to, I, I think they bought into the, the, the cloud narrative of, hey, you don't want to do this heavy lifting, you want to shift those resources to support whatever, digital transformation or you know, application delivery, but to get the, from point A to point B and keep the lights on is, is obviously challenging. So you talked about some of the, the underlying rip currents and trends, you mentioned SDDC. Mm -hmm. so, why is that important? First of all, what is it in, mm -hmm. in your mind? How do you guys look at that and why is it so important? Well, so, you know, software-defined data center computing is really, you know, software-defined anything is really the decoupling of um, the control plane from the data plane, right? How can we manage all of this data, where it comes from and where it goes from a centralized, automated uh, point? And um, so what's important about that is it allows us to provision more quickly than ever before, it allows us to make changes more quickly than ever before, and it allows our data to be more portable than ever before, giving us the ability to move information and data on-prem to a public service and back, uh, be able to replicate and back up data to really any place that we need it to be, and then making it more available for our global organizations to be able to get access to it at any time. Uh, in development environments that you know, follow the sun methodology, right, of, of being able to have access to that data for development teams all over the world is critically important. And, um, you know, public services as well as you know, hybrid and other cloud delivery models allow them to do that. So it used to be pretty straightforward. Uh, we didn't maybe realize at the time, but you'd build a basically a, 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 an infrastructure stack, you'd support an application, you'd harden that, and it be, kind of became its own silo as mm -hmm. cloud comes into play, hybrid cloud, now you talk about multi-cloud, the, the, the picture gets a lot more complex. And you mentioned separating the control plane and the data plane as you go into this you know, multi-cloud. Well, first of all, multi-cloud, I've, I've said, is kind of a symptom of multi-vendor. We sort of just got here, but now, I think, as is often the case in IT, 
people are saying, well, we have to control this, we have to have governance and compliance and security, so we, we better get IT to come fix this problem. Is that a viable sort of you know, narrative from my standpoint? Is that how we got here, or has it really been a strategy in your view? Well, I think it's both. I think more mature organizations understand now, mm -hmm. um, maybe not at first, understand now that there's different reasons to use different services. Right, so uh, it may be that a particular public service has uh, has some you know uh, application environment or some process that is appealing to them. Maybe it complies with some sort of governance or compliance requirement. Um, but there may also be times, and there are with most of our customers, where they need to keep that information, that data on prem for whatever reason, either due to security policy or due to compliance reasons or or something else, and. So organizations started to figure out they couldn't just put everything all in one place, right? Even if it was a public service, that they needed the ability to have some data in different places, and they needed that to be affordable. Um, and so that was the challenge. And and as organizations started to realize that that hybrid cloud strategy was a sound one, uh, they needed the technology to be able to support that. And so that's when we when we start taking a look at software defined solutions, we're looking at the ability of those. Uh, those uh, the solutions to, to be able to communicate back and forth, right? How do we move data back and forth? What products do we select that allow us to create API connectivity to all of those different endpoints, right? Whether it's a, a public cloud service or on-prem or both, how are we able to fluidly move data back and forth? Okay, so you had, and you also had a lot of shadow IT, which kind of, I feel like IT is beginning to, to rein in, uh, at least from the standpoint of setting standards, but okay, so you just described this, this, this state of, of cloud. I'll call it cloud because to, to us, it seems that you're bringing the cloud experience wherever your data lives. Could be on-prem, could be in cloud vendor A, B, or C, some kind of hybrid structure. So how do you bring that cloud experience to wherever your data lives, and what role does storage play? Yep, all right. So. So first, there's, there's, there's a few high level elements to, we'll call it this hybrid cloud model, right? One is a financial model. You know, in a public service today, you know, we talk about um, you know, the ability to go swipe a credit card and now you've got this instant access to infrastructure. Um, you know, that's a financial model that, that is easy to consume, right? But how do you do that on-prem? So we work with different partners to put together those financial models that are similar to public services in an on-prem consumption model. And so we can do things like capacity on demand, pay for what you need only when you need it, right? Expand and contract on-prem, just like you would in a public service. So that financial model is one place to start. The second place to start is with the infrastructure, and you mentioned storage, and storage is a great example of that. So we want to have storage that has the ability to connect out to those public services or other platforms when we need them to, when we need it to. Uh, matter of fact, at WEI, that's, that's one of the things that we look at very carefully is what is that you know, second, third mile approach to implementing all of this? How do we automate um, the movement of that data and the connectivity of all this infrastructure together? Well, you've got to, you've got to have some, um, some automation that is customized to your environment because it's it's not a cookie cutter approach. And so uh, to be able to develop that automation is what we call that, that you know, second mile, third mile service where we're connecting all of these things. Right? So we want to be able to select a, a storage platform, for instance, that has API connectivity um, uh, that we can leverage to connect to you know, Microsoft Azure or to AWS or to Google or someplace else. Uh, and that we want to also be able to connect to our compute platforms um, that we're leveraging on-prem. And so that, and our network, right, that, that is on-prem and that is extended out to those public services. And does the intelligence uh, for, to enable that automation, does that live inside the, the infrastructure? Is it something that you have to bring to, a, to the table? Is it a, is it a combination or is it is it actually intrinsic now to the architectures that are out there? It's both. Uh, so there is more and more of that intelligence coming to the to the hardware being developed into the hardware. And um, you know, some of our partners that we work with have done a really good job of building that into their solutions. You know, HPE as an example, uh, with some of their storage platforms uses their InfoSight uh, capability to to uh, build intelligence in and AI and machine learning into optimizing 
um, uh, their, their storage platform and being able to uh, give customers the ability to see uh, problems before they even arise. So that's one piece of it. And the other piece of it is, you know, are those APIs already written on the platform? Can we leverage those already? Do we have to develop that ourselves? Have they been developed to work with certain automation platforms uh, that we can leverage? So, um, so yeah, it's, it, a lot of this built into the infrastructure today, and um, and then how you customize that for your own use case, uh, it requires you know uh, somewhat experience and and uh, and the, the capability to actually develop those automations. You know, it's interesting, Dave. When, if you go back five, six, even seven, maybe even longer years ago, people were really afraid of automation. Uh, they wanted knobs to turn. Um, and so my question is, do you see people much more receptive? Why, what's, what's, what's changed? I, mean, I do, people seem much more receptive to automation, but what's changed? Um, well, I think it's, it's kind of actually what you just mentioned, right? People uh, thought that there was this magic dial, you know, magic knob that they could turn when they wanted infrastructure. I want more infrastructure, I'll turn it this way. I want less infrastructure, I'll right. turn it that way. Not really understanding the effort it took to make that happen. Uh, in the background, and I think that there's more awareness now of what that effort is. We see organizations moving resources, meaning you know their people and their skills from traditional IT roles into these automation roles, giving them um, you know new skills to be able to support all of this ongoing automation requirement to be able to make the the you know the the business uh, more responsive. So instead of uh, IT organizations being reactive like they used to, i.e., they would receive a request and then they would have to go in and you know architect around that request. They're actually building the infrastructure and the automations up front so when the request comes in, they can actually turn that dial knob. So they're building the dial knob by moving those resources into new skill sets. Well, so that's an interesting point about the skill sets. I mean, I've always often said, if your main skill set is managing LUNs, you really want to update your skill sets and <laughs> you know, yeah, find, yeah. find a new job, basically. So what are people doing? Are they moving into development? Are they moving into sort of becoming cloud architects? What, what would you advise somebody who's traditionally been a, a storage admin um, what's their growth path? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, it, it, we would advise them to stop managing LUNs uh, and to move into um, you know, different uh, automation skill sets, different uh, programming. Understand some of the programming languages out there now like Python mm -hmm. and, and Perl and other things that are commonly used you know, in, in developing these scripts. Uh, understand API structures uh, and you know, most of this is open, right? So if you understand uh, it from a general sense, you'll be able to apply it to just about any platform. Um, understand uh, automations behind um, uh, provisioning infrastructure and the tools that are out there that are available to do that, and there's a lot of them, and we, we work with many of them with our customers today. And if you can, uh, if you can develop those skill sets, um, you'll be able to manage in this new world, in this new hybrid, you know, IT and hybrid cloud world. And we talk about DevOps a lot, we talk about infrastructure as code, but I, I still feel as though in many organizations, I'd love your thoughts on this, it's still early days in terms of, you know, there's probably more ops dev than there is DevOps, but, but are you, are you, what are you seeing in terms of the uptake of, of that DevOps philosophy, programmable infrastructure and the skill sets to be able to support that within some of your larger customers. I think there's a separation there, right? When most organizations think about DevOps, they're thinking about um, you know, their products or their, their, you know, their own internal application development. Mm. Um, and I think there, that when we talk about infrastructure, automation and provisioning, it's generally, in most enterprise environments, completely separate teams, right? And, and yes, a lot of that is coming together, but you've got one organization in IT that is creating a service for those DevOps teams, right? Uh, in the past, you know, when we talk about shadow IT, it was those DevOps teams who were swiping the credit card because they needed something instantly so they could develop something and then share it globally. And now, we've got IT organizations who have, who have stopped fighting that. And what they really want to do is be able to deliver that same experience in a controlled, secured, and you know, financially viable way right, to be able to support those DevOps initiatives. Let's talk about your partnership with HPE. Mm -hmm. What are you guys doing with H, H, HPE? Kind of what sets you guys apart? Yeah, sure, so uh, WEI is an HPE Platinum partner. 
and we work with HP across uh, really their entire portfolio. And we understand their initiatives around um, data center uh, automation, uh, creating a hybrid IT uh, environment, uh, some of the solutions that they have around the financial models. Uh, for instance, HPE GreenLake uh, is a way to create those, those cloud-like financial models uh, in um, an on-prem environment uh, and extend that out to public services so that you have that same experience of swiping that credit card. Uh, in a public service, so um, we work with uh, with HPE as you know they're they're a leader in uh, IT infrastructure and have been for a long time and across all of their product lines for compute, storage, and networking. How important is GreenLake, um, mm -hmm. uh, and and how differentiable is it from you know other companies who who do this? Is it pretty much table stakes uh, to be able to have that sort of pay by the drink? Um, is, is there anything unique and different about GreenLake from your perspective? Yeah, I mean there is, right? It, essentially it's giving organizations the ability to have that public service experience on-prem and consume what they need when they need it. Um, and then more importantly, capitalize that if they really want to, right? So, you know, many organizations are, are trying to juggle that, that capital expense versus operational expense uh, you know, budget, and so uh, GreenLake allows them to have that subscription-like experience in a capitalized model, which is important for many organizations. Ah, okay, but uh, so, so is it their choice to go OpEx or CapEx? Is that so they can, okay. And I can understand why some organizations would want to do that. Maybe there's tax benefits, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, I want to ask you about sort of cloud. It's a, it's a huge mega trend, you know, one of the superpowers as they say, we've heard the stats, 80% of the sort of install base is still on-prem, only 20% has moved to the cloud. We talk a lot about cloud 2.0, kind of a play on, on web yeah. uh, 2.0. What is that? Well, it's containers, it's hybrid, it's, it's multi-cloud. Um, it, if you're thinking about the next era of cloud, what do you see as 2.0, if we can kind of define that on, <laughs> the, on the fly? Oh boy, um, and on camera for, for Yeah, there you go. I mean, is that those, in forever more, are those right? reasonable so, parameters? Hybrid, you know, multi-cloud, containers, maybe infrastructure as a code? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, so. Or is it all BS, just uh, uh, acronym soup in our industry? No, I don't think it's BS, right? I think that, I mean, so let's take a look at the evolution of cloud, right? If you looked at it, say, in two, you know, five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, everyone said, that'll never happen, we would never put our data out there, it's not secure. Um, and then you looked at it, say, you know, five years ago or less, everyone was going to the cloud. We're just going to move everything, we're going to DR everything over to the cloud, and we're going to get rid of all our data centers. You know, and then a couple years ago, everyone said, well, hold on, hold on a second, that, that's probably not realistic, right? There's a use, there's sometimes, uh, you know, there's going to be a need to keep some data on-prem either you know, for compliance reasons or for technology reasons. I mean, we need this data close to us for other things. Who knows what it is? Um, so a hybrid cloud, right, and our ability to create all of these processes internally, those automations to make that on-prem experience feel the same as it would in a public service, is, is where most enterprises have realized they need to be, right? So that's kind of been the journey to get here. Now, um, I think that that, that hybrid cloud uh, experience that organizations are making these investments into right now is probably where, where they will be for the next five to 10 years, right? Now what comes after that? You mentioned multi-cloud before, right? And I think that's probably a, a realistic expectation, right? As the commoditization of everything in IT occurs, I, I, this is just you know, my speculation that, that that may occur in the cloud as well, right? And so as the affordability and as you know, the, uh, the, the network performance and the cost of that ability comes down and, and more and more commoditized, um, uh, there'll be fewer and fewer reasons to make those on-prem investments. And so I think a multi-cloud strategy becomes uh, realistic for many organizations who have already started that, right? We've got some stuff in Google, we've got some stuff in Azure, we've got some stuff in AWS. Um, but as we can make the platforms that our applications are running on um, kind of agnostic across cloud, it's just another service, right? And, and, and organizations are going to go for the lowest costs and you know, lowest risk environment. If I can containerize most of my applications and I can move them from cloud to cloud because containers are very portable, why wouldn't I do that? And I think that's where, I, where it could possibly go within the next you know, decade. We'll yeah, if you can create that consistent experience across clouds. You and I have talked about this just in terms of 
the the big hyper cloud guys have have taken labor cost out of the equation, and now they can charge you for that convenience. Uh, but you you believe that you can actually close that gap with on-prem infrastructure, and I've often said that the traditional companies, vendor, tech vendors, they don't have to match the cloud capabilities. They just have to be cloud-like. They can they can be good enough. Um, and and so my question is, uh, do you buy that? And and have they at least closed the gap to the point where? You can do a lot of the things that you can get in the in the public cloud and, and not have to pay for the automation, so you can sort of replicate those substantially on-prem. So, so I agree, right? And, and here's, here's an example of, of how I think that is happening. If you look at what, for instance, Microsoft is doing with Azure Stack, right? What is Azure Stack? It's the ability to extend you know, Microsoft Azure Cloud on-prem, by putting it in your data center. Now I've got this consistent platform across multiple locations, on-prem and the cloud. Uh, AWS is doing the same thing. So that tells me that they also believe hybrid is going to be around for a while, otherwise they wouldn't put effort into developing these platforms, right, to extend their own platform to your, to your data center. Um, so, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but I th I, that's an example to me of, of, of why I think hybrid is the way that most organizations are going, and that the, the, the industry in general, including those, those hyperscalers, believe um, that, uh, that this is going to be around for a while. I'm, I'm glad you brought up Microsoft, because they're a fascinating example. They, everybody talks about the innovator's dilemma, and you would think that Microsoft was a company that was going to struggle with that, where they've clearly figured out, the, and they were early on with, with Azure Stack. And to your early point, it's about the control plane, the data plane, and being able to have that consistent experience across clouds. So okay, so my takeaway is, so infrastructure still is important yes. <laughs> these days. Kind of all these new emerging workloads, you know, matter. There's, it's it's also important to be able to replicate substantially that cloud experience on-prem in hybrid, and that kind of sets up this, really, this new architecture. I wonder if you could kind of summarize your vision of what this new architecture looks like over the next, you know, five. 10 years? Um, well, I'll say it once again. The, you know, <laughs> the, the, the way to, how do I summarize this? Um, developing an automated IT service delivery model that is cloud-like in nature, on-prem, and as well as extending that to public services and creating a single experience um, for, your, uh, for, your, for your user base is where IT organizations are trying to put their effort today. That's how they're trying, that's what they're trying to get to for the future, at least for the next five years or so. Um, creating a hybrid cloud uh, environment is, uh, is the way that they're going to accomplish that. Who they choose as public services is generally a business decision. It's uh, uh, not as much a technical decision, um, but uh, what they put on prem has got to be able to, you know, to, to work with all of those environments. And that sort of sort of summarizes what I think of, of cloud 2.0. We haven't even talked about the edge, but that's a whole another equation. But the idea of leaving the data where it is, if that makes sense, uh, and then shipping code to data is something this, and building out massive distributed networks uh, that actually talk to each other. That is a, a great vision. Dave, you've been an awesome guest. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. You're welcome, and thank you for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante. We'll see you next time.